um, and uh, workshops on um, OSINT and um, on uh, doing, um, you know, using Bitcoin and uh, we do some work with uh, the government and uh, with some um, uh, law enforcement to help bring them up to speed with uh, the new world of cybercrime. So two of the main terms we're going to be talking about here are doxing and swatting, so I wanted to set them in context uh, for this talk. Uh, when I talk about doxing, I mean having uh, somebody's information, uh, typically their private information, and then posting it in a public forum, uh, and then uh, telling people to go look at it and use this uh, information for nefarious purposes. Usually it includes the full name, uh, current physical address, um, email addresses, usernames, phone numbers, um, and uh, pictures. Sometimes it'll include things like uh, social security numbers, uh, bank account and routing information, um, and then all of this information about people that they're tied to, like their friends and family. Um, and then from that information, something that can happen and unfortunately does happen is swatting, uh, where a uh, SWAT team is deployed to a house based on a false call, um, and that house is usually the target um, for harassment. So why do we care about doxing? Well, there's sort of a, a hierarchy of uh, things to care about here. It's, um, you know, there's some basic things that can happen that um, are annoying but easy to deal with, uh, like having people give you prank calls or um, send you uh, prank messages uh, to the information that was released. Also getting some gray marketing or people trying to scam you. Um, and then uh, the next level would be like having something you didn't want out there, out there. Uh, maybe you have a, a hobby that you really want to keep to yourself and to your closed forums, but having that outed uh, can sometimes be damaging. Um, and then um, online and in-person, harassment, bullying, um, stalking. And then um, identity theft, usually financial identity theft in this case. Um, and then of course having a SWAT team bust down your door sucks, uh, so that's definitely a danger. And then being targeted for a physical attack, um, either yourself or your property, which we'll see examples of that later. Um, so it's, um, it, it, the online stuff is tough to deal with, but it's the in-person stuff that gets really scary. Uh, even if they're not attacking you personally, they can do a lot to um, harm your way of life or uh, damage you. Um, one of the things, if they have your physical address, the, they can um, go and slash your tires. Um, so that's something you really, really don't want to happen because it causes, well, yeah, slashing tires. Um, so, you know, those, those are all sort of theoretical things that can happen, but I want to get into some real cases to make it tangible. Um, the first one I want to talk about, uh, this was during the Boston bombings um, when Reddit and 4chan decided to be the uh, internet police um, and do some amazing detective work. Uh, so one of the people that they outed as being a prime suspect for uh, the uh, bomber in Boston was Sunil Tripathi, which, surprise, surprise, he was brown. Um, and so he had been missing since March 16th, um, and uh, he was uh, not only identified as um, a really good uh, um, target for being the bomber on 4chan and Reddit, but a lot of news services picked it up. Um, and when they started repeating it, it lended a false sense of credibility to the claim. Um, so his family started receiving uh, death threats, um, and uh, his family's and his personal information was released online. Um, they were targeted. Uh, both in person and uh, digitally. Um, so what had really happened here was uh, Sunil Tripathi was missing because he had committed suicide before the bombings took place. Um, and his body was later found in the Providence River. So his family was not only having to deal with uh, the death of their son, but they were having to deal with all of this um, harassment and death threats. Another example uh, where uh, doxing went awry is uh, where Amanda Todd, um, online, uh, she took her life after um, a long history of being um, uh, blackmailed and stalked uh, online. Um, and so Anonymous wanted to play White Knight and find out who did it and make them pay. Uh, again, they doxed the wrong person. Um, so the person that they uh, doxed, they also included a lot of his um, uh, business information. So his boss eventually told him, look, you need to make this stop, which of course he can't, uh, or you're going to be fired. Uh, he ended up getting fired from his job because of the harassment, uh, and he eventually it became so bad he had to move across the country and legally change his name. So that's uh, his his complete all of his life just you know uprooted because of this false doxing. Um, another person uh, and and their mother who got caught up in uh, this doxing craze was uh, when uh, Michael Brown was shot in Ferguson. 
Um, anonymous again wanted to find out uh, who the police officer was that shot him. Uh, they ended up doxing somebody that had never had any dealings with the Ferguson police. Um, and uh, they ended up not only doxing him, but his mother as well. And they were able to get things like social security numbers uh, and uh, maiden names. So what happened was uh, a lot of uh, credit cards and bank accounts, um, lines of credit, things like that were opened up in their name. Uh, and they're still cleaning up all of that um, ID theft fraud that they had to deal with. Um, and of course, their, um, their scores are you know, in the trash. So all of that is, uh, it's, it's difficult to deal with, um, but there isn't necessarily an immediate sense of danger. Um, but something that does cause that immediate sense of danger is uh, having a group of uh, heavily armed people uh, bust in your door, um, perhaps at 3 a.m. without a knock, um, and uh, having guns, wa guns and lights waved in your face where you're a little groggy. Um, either you or your dog might very well uh, end up getting hurt in that situation. Or if uh, you sleep next to weapons, uh, one of the officers might end up getting hurt. So you can see a lot of examples of uh, swatting happening live from uh, various online gamers that were uh, playing a game against somebody or a group of people and somebody they were playing with or somebody who was watching them uh, took offense to either something they said or them just being alive in general um, and then calls on the SWAT team to uh, their house after doxing them. Um, uh, during Gamergate, which is kind of still going on, um, a lot of the uh, proponents of opening up gaming um, as a lifestyle and um, as a, a recreation to a broader demographic um, became targets uh, of uh, doxing and swatting as well. Uh, and there are uh, a number of stories online about this. There's also uh, Ashley Kutcher got doxxed like seven times, um, and uh, he's been swatted multiple times. Uh, Brian Krebs has, but that's not really surprising given what he does for a living. Um, and because uh, he, he makes a, a job out of pissing off skiddies, so. Uh, but uh, both Ashton Kutcher and Brian Krebs uh, had some success in protecting themselves against swatting, and I'll talk about how they did that later. Now, if you're uh, a real chicken shit and you don't want to do it yourself, uh, there is a new uh, SAS, that's Swatting as a Service. Um, and uh, this is on one of the darknet websites. Uh, if you pay a hundred bucks within ten days, uh, this guy will uh, um, get the uh, SWAT team to bust into the target of your choice. Um, so you think, uh, is this a real service? Do people actually use this? Turns out he has really good ratings. Uh, so these are actually pretty recent. Um, you know, people saying, hey, it actually worked. He actually got the cops to come. Um, the you know uh, delivered as promised. Um, I wasn't tracked. He's very good at what he or she does. Um, yep. Terrible human being. All right. Uh, so it's not just a Western phenomenon, right? Uh, so we see uh, uh, analogs for doxing uh, both in Asia and in Eastern Europe um, and in the former Soviet bloc. So in, in China, it's typically referred to as the human flesh search engine. Uh, and uh, it started out as a collaborative um, sort of uh, um, meat research on mass scale. Uh, and what they would do initially is they would look for um, uh, evidence of uh, people who are officials in power that have been uh, taking bribes, um, or they look for people who have been falsifying their information um, and their research, which is a big problem in China right now. And uh, it started out as that sort of like, we want to do this good, but we need other people to do it with us. So I know somebody who works here, you know somebody that works there, we'll get a little bit of information there and here and put it together. Um, but it started turning after a while and being used um, to out people who didn't need to be outed or were outed incorrectly. Uh, it was also used to turn minor internet, internet celebrities into um, uh, objects of uh, stalking and fixation. Um, and uh, it's uh, that two-edged sword that we see in all of the cases of doxing. Um, for the Russian and former Soviet bloc, uh, it is almost exclusively focused on um, uh, getting information about celebrities. And uh, for some reason, rap celebrities are huge, especially their cell phone numbers. They're worth quite a bit on the underground markets. Um, and they're traded typically like baseball cards. Um, uh, one guy will say, hey, I have this celebrity and this celebrity's information, um, but I want this. I'll trade with you if you have it. Um, so in China, this is an example of uh, what, what's called a watch uncle campaign. And what they do is they find um, uh, officials uh, who are um, officiating over typically very, very small areas or poor areas 
um, that have uh, flashy watches. Um, and these officials tend to uh, wear a different flashy watch for each day of the year. Um, on their salary, they obviously should not be able to afford these watches. Um, so uh, what they do is they go online and try to find um, evidence or pictures of um, these guys wearing uh, really, really expensive watches. Uh, and you can see that this particular um, uh, bright student of this online campaign decided, before anybody could take my picture, i got to take off my watch. Uh, turns out the sun burned him around his watch area, so that didn't really work out for him. What's the circle at the bottom? Um, so that's showing where there's a bulge in his pocket where the watch is. Um, so the, uh, this is the other side of, um, of that, and uh, this is an innocent taxi owner. Um, what happened was uh, a taxi drove by in a, a town in China and rolled down his window and spat on a homeless person that was on the side of the road. Um, a couple of the eyewitnesses were only able to get a partial uh, license plate number, and unfortunately this taxi owner's license plate matches that partial, but um, you know, of course they can't know the rest. Um, and he was outed as being the most likely candidate, uh, so of course in everybody's mind he was the person that did it. Uh, he had red paint thrown all over his house, death threats written um, uh, to him um, almost daily, uh, telling him that they're going to ruin his business and he better move out of the city. Um, and things like that, uh, which unfortunately, you know, he's here he is saying, like, I'm innocent, that wasn't me that did it. Um, and uh, some really, really nice Eastern European guy uh, put up this webpage for a while. Um, it's, it's not down, uh, or it's not up on the clear net anymore, uh, but he uh, had collected a whole bunch of um, different people's uh, celebrities and uh, well-known persons' uh, uh, information, including social security numbers, cell phone numbers, addresses, um, and he just posted them for free for everybody. Um, so Britney Spears, Hulk Hogan, uh, Donald Trump, eh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, Octomom, in case you wanted to call her cell phone. Um, so it's not only used against uh, innocent people, it's also used uh, between um, people on uh, Darknet and um, underground forums who are uh, uh, either at war with each other for some uh, perceived slight or for uh, market share in some form or another. Um, so uh, skids who like to proclaim themselves as being undoxable inevitably are the first ones to be doxed. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a big thing that you can see in, if you really have the constitution to sit and listen to them in their IRC forums um, or IRC chants or in their forums. Uh, they uh, try and dox each other all the time. Uh, when Doxman was still up, and there are a couple other ones like it out now, uh, you, it was just 14 and 13 year olds left and right being doxed. Um, it's also used to uh, outrival sellers and to get uh, their market share. If, say, uh, you have uh, plastic for um, uh, cloning credit cards or a uh, machine that you're selling on an underground forum for uh, doing uh, credit card cloning, then uh, you want to get rid of all the other people who are also selling that product so you can up your price by uh, cornering the market. And what you do is you end up doxing the other sellers and then find out where they live and give all of that doxing information and uh, proof that they're selling things to their local police. Uh, that way they get uh, caught and then you get to sell where they used to. Um, it's also used as a response to people who are considered rippers or grifters. Uh, this is people who uh, promise a service, like uh, they're going to crypt your um, uh, your uh, malicious file for you so it can't be detected by AV, um, and uh, they go ahead and pay you, and then you don't deliver on your service. Uh, and then those guys get uh, doxxed left and right as well. Um, it's also used on darknet markets, uh, typically uh, Tor markets, uh, as a form of coercion to get you to finalize early. Um, as a seller, you're giving up quite a bit of information about yourself in order to uh, get a physical product. And if your OPSEC isn't good, which most of the buyer's OPSEC is terrible, uh, then uh, the vendor can turn around and say, look, I have all this information about you, I'll give it to the police unless you finalize early and you don't get your product, but I get your money. Um, it's also used as a uh, sort of get out of jail free card. What happens is uh, darknet market vendors will get all of this information on their buyers and then when they eventually get pinched by the police, what they say is, hey, I've got all this information on all these people that were buying these illicit goods. Um, if I turn informant and you let me go, I'll give you this information. All right, so how do they do this? How do they find all this information about us? Well, they, of course, start with the Googles. 
and uh, they use what they call Google Foo, which is just really understanding Boolean and search operators. Um, and uh, they'll typically start with a username or an email address, if they have one or the other, and then try to match um, all of the usernames that were used in conjunction with an email address or all of the email addresses that were used in conjunction with a username. This allows them to get, um, you know, find all kinds of different forums you were on. Um, they'll also use, look for variations of usernames. Like if you were Sweetie Bunny 123, they would look for Sweetie Bunny or Sweetie Bunny um, 111, you know, go through all of those iterations. Um, and if they could find other points that match uh, to say that this account is also one of the accounts you use, then that's more information that they have. Um, also, when you put something online, uh, it's, it's really good to think about, am I okay with this being out there publicly forever and ever, amen? Uh, because just because a website goes down or that you've requested the information be removed or you've deleted it doesn't mean it's not still in the database backup or um, in uh, like the Wayback Machine or Google Cache or Corel Cache. So uh, another place that they go to uh, pretty immediately is social media. Um, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, people put tons and tons of personal information out on those. Uh, contact info, uh, where they go, uh, when they go, um, family member information, who their friends are, their acquaintances, um, what their hobbies are, their skill sets, uh, the jobs that they currently have and the places that they used to work, um, as well as who their colleagues are. This is all really, really good for social engineering. Um, also, it gives an idea of uh, patterns of behavior, uh, what places they go to regularly, things like that, um, and when they're not at home. Uh, fuck you, Foursquare. Uh, also, um, all of this information that you can get from social media is really good for uh, building a database to be able to answer people's security questions to reset their passwords, um, especially for their main email accounts. Because if you can reset that password, then you can get access to all the other accounts. Um, also, the things that we don't necessarily think about as social media, but are uh, forums, uh, groups like Yahoo groups, uh, mailing lists, especially mailman mailing lists. A lot of times, uh, archiving is on by default on those. Uh, there, uh, when you for the most popular forum uh, uh, frameworks, it asks you when you sign up for an account for your birth date, age, and location. A lot of people answer that truthfully. So then, on your public profile, it lists you know your birth date, your age, and your geolocation how long you've been there, how many posts you've made, how often you post, things like that. Um, also, if you're in a forum that's maybe a weird or non-mainstream hobby, um, that may be something you want to keep on the down low, that's information that can get out as well. Also, it gives an idea of who you talk to a lot. So uh, what usernames or email addresses online are you um, in conversation with often? Uh, that's really good to be uh, spoofed and then used as a trust vector to uh, get you to click on something malicious or get more information out of you. Um, also, a lot of these uh, social media um, groups and forums uh, are, are breached, or they will be breached at some point in the near future. Um, there are a couple examples of this is just within the last year or so. Um, Epic Games forums, uh, CBS Photo, all of those uh, accounts were breached. Um, the My Freedom Smokes forum, uh, Action Target, Law Enforcement Targets, Haynes. For some reason, somebody hacked Veggie Tales. I don't know why they would do that. Um, Twitch, I know why they would do that. Um, Slack, Slack was a, a really interesting hack in that it's a, um, a chat mechanism, so uh, there's a lot of uh, good information that would uh, be gained there, especially since people thought that their chats were private. Um, and then those are all sort of like general forums. You might not be giving up too much juicy information there, uh, but there are other places where a lot of people gave up really juicy information, like the adult friend finder breach. Um, so there was a, a lot of blackmailing that came out of that because it told not only uh, who your online connections and partners were, but what sort of kinks you were into. Uh, so yeah, uh, that one was bad, but probably not as bad as the Ashley Madison one. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sure all of you are aware of this Ashley Madison hack. Um, and while I don't feel too bad for the guys that were caught up in that, um, and the, what, 112 women that were caught up in it, um, then uh, I, I do feel bad for their families, though, because uh, there are uh, groups of uh, loosely affiliated with Anonymous um, kids who are going around and collating by location um, the accounts and their contact information and doxing them and then uh, contacting all of their friends and family and outing them as somebody who had an Ashley Madison account. 
Another place where you can get a lot of personal information about somebody uh, uh, is their, uh, when they register a domain name. It asks you to enter in your real um, uh, email address that you use, uh, your physical location or the physical location of your business, um, your phone number, and then if you're still in the 90s, your fax number. There are also some tools that makes this easier. Um, the Harvester is a really fun tool. So this one will allow you to uh, go ahead and get a bunch of information um, on an entity or uh, a particular um, individual, especially if you have the domain for their main email address. Um, and uh, Multigo helps you not only with the transforms for searching, but to think about the uh, relationships and connections differently. Um, uh, creepy is uh, a Python script that is creepy. Um, it goes through and finds a bunch of information through um, the APIs of uh, Facebook, through um, Foursquare, through Twitter, um, to get a lot of information that you can't typically get through the browser, but the API leaks. Uh, Recon NG is a really good framework for uh, doing a lot of the things that some of these other tools do, <coughs> but also being able to organize it um, in a way that's uh, pretty uh, conducive to, uh, to really doxing somebody and building a good dossier. There's a few other tools. Um, if you're interested in them, um, I can give you some links to other ones. Uh, there's one uh, called um, OSSense Stalker. It has a, a Facebook stalker, which uses the um, Facebook Graph API, uh, which even if you've really locked down your Facebook um, uh, profile, it gets information through your friends and your friends of friends. Um, and uh, it's able to build a profile about you through that. Um, it also has an OSN stalker, or a, um, a geo stalker. And what that does is it goes through all of the APIs of social media platforms that use uh, GPS data for where you are and what you're doing. Uh, and it'll collate that to build a pattern of where you go and when you go. Yeah? Oh, no, no. So the last two I was talking about, the Facebook stalker and the geo stalker, those are OSINT stalker, okay. uh, open source intelligence, OSINT. Okay, OSINT stalker. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then Recon NG is another one that has a bunch of scripts that are similar to what the Harvester does, uh, what Creepy does. So I would say um, OSINT, Stalker, and Recon NG are probably the two most powerful ones there. Um, and another place to get a scary amount of information on individuals is through data brokers or data clearinghouses. I'm sure some of you have either seen the ads or tried to look up and then realized you had to pay even though it didn't look like it at first. Uh, to Spokio, Intellius, People, PQ, there are a bunch of them out there. Um, and for free, typically you can get the full name, sometimes the maiden name. Uh, the age, the current and former addresses, um, and all of this information about their family members. The funny thing is a lot of them try to only give you like a partial phone number for the person, but they all do it differently. So if you just go across them and get the little bits of the phone number, you can get the whole one uh, out of those parts. Um, also if you pay more, then you get more information. Uh, you can get things like criminal records, uh, school records, retail activity information. The retail activity information is interesting. Um, uh, when you go to a store and they ask you for your zip code and your phone number and that sort of information that really doesn't make sense for the type of purchase you're making, it's because a lot of times that information is bundled up and sold uh, to third parties for targeted marketing uh, and uh, they're not really scrupulous about who they sell that to. As long as you've got a bag of money, you can get that information. Uh, so in Tellius, uh, you can see they have, they don't tell you what to use the data for. Um, they just say, you know, this is the types of data we'll give you at these different tiers of pricing. Um, and of course, there's a special for first time buyers. You can be a first time buyer every time, right? Yes, you can. <laughs> and uh, Spokio is a little, little more specific about uh, what their information is. Uh, they actually, this is one of their advertisements that's running right now. Uh, they say that they uncover personal photos, videos, and secrets guaranteed. Um, you know, you want to see something juicy? Spokio searches deep within 48 major social networks to find the truly mouth-watering news about friends and coworkers. Wow. You run that on yourself? Yeah. Uh, luckily, I have a very common uh, name, so it's great. It's very, very, uh, very difficult, but it's not impossible to dox me. Uh, public records, another uh, huge, huge place for getting information on people. Um, they're a pain in the ass to go through, 
uh, because a lot of them are using outdated systems or um, the governments that are uh, local governments that are bringing these public records online um, aren't uh, they don't hire good UX UI people uh, so uh, when you are incorporating a business or um, buying a piece of property or a house when you are registering for a patent or a trademark um, they're gonna ask you for a lot of information that is then made public um, so it's information about your business partners, about your addresses and theirs, um, histories of business connections, um, and mappings to other entities that you've been involved with over time. Uh, there are even business websites that have cool little graphs that show you and the different buildings and people you're connected to and how you're connected to them. Um, an example of a public record is uh, this is a public record for um, a home in um, Buncombe County, North Carolina. And uh, this is, uh, you know, anybody can go on the website for the county and look at this. Uh, it gives owner information, you know, where they live, uh, what their current address is, as well as the address of the property, um, how much the property is worth, how much it's sold for, uh, the history of the property, um, and uh, the history of the taxing. And uh, something really interesting here is it, it gives ownership history in that you can see if it was just recently sold. And if a property was just recently sold, and you were posing as the person who just sold the property, I bet your target will open up any attachment you send to them through email. Uh, so it also gives information about the physical layout of the house, including square footage of each section. Um, and uh, a lot of times it'll tell you uh, what the slope and grade is on the yard, things like that. So if somebody was planning on uh, you know, being a super creeper and stalking you, uh, then now they have all the information they need to plan that out accordingly. Don't be scared. Um, other public records that uh, give a lot of information about you, when you give political contributions, uh, if you're not being super sneaking and doing it through a super PAC, then um, it gives your name, address, your political affiliation, and the donation amounts, especially with a history of donation amounts and some other information. Uh, you can have a pretty good shot at guessing somebody's uh, income or net worth. Um, also, petitions, petitions for recall, things like that. Uh, that gives name, geographic location, and again, um, fuel for social engineering if they know what you're passionate about. EXIF data, uh, so sometimes called metadata. A lot of media, uh, pictures, uh, videos, audio, um, along with uh, the actual um, stuff that you want, has attached to it on the back end uh, information about the device or the uh, program that was used to create it. Um, times and dates when it was created or modified, um, and a lot of times GPS coordinates about uh, you know when it was created. So uh, an example of that is this is a um, pic this is the information from a picture taken with a Nikon D300, uh, and this is with its default settings on. Uh, it gives the time and date that the picture was taken, as well as the latitude and longitude of where the picture was taken. So this information isn't necessarily used for nefarious purposes all the time. It's also been used effectively to um, go ahead and send out drones uh, to members of the Islamic State. Um, and uh, speaking specifically on EXIF data in media, um, Air Force General uh, Hawk Carlisle said that it was a post on social media to bombs on target in less than 24 hours. So they were able to get the EXIF data from uh, the social media account um, and use that to target them for a drone strike. Um, and uh, just because Facebook or Imager or Twitter um, doesn't show the EXIF data when they repost it. Uh, they sure as hell keep it in their database when you upload it. Um, another instance of it being used uh, is uh, when um, El Chapo, um, or um, uh, the, he's the leader of the Sinola cartel uh, in Mexico, um, his uh, dumbass son, uh, they were, so they're hiding in Central America, um, trying to run from the uh, Mexican military. And his son took a picture of them all eating in Costa Rica and left GPS on. I bet he caught a beating for that. So uh, social engineering is a big part of uh, doxing as well, um, if you really want to get a lot of juicy information about somebody. Um, calling their ISP or their phone company um, can get you uh, some really good information, including uh, call records, social security numbers, um, uh, what their browsing history has been, um, you know, all that sort of uh, account login information. Um, and uh, it's really effective, especially when they call um, uh, 
posing as a spouse or a family member or a delegate. Uh, the people who are typically tier one for ISP and phone companies don't get trained very well on spotting, uh, uh, phishing, or um, social engineering. Um, also, uh, calling current or former places of work, pretending that you are doing a background check or that you are a new place of work that is doing a reference check, you can get a lot of information out of people. Um, also, if you call their family uh, posing as a friend or call their friends posing as a family member and pretend that there's an emergency with your target, that uh, they're in uh, mortal danger or they're hurt really bad, um, when uh, those friends or family members go into panic mode, they don't tend to think critically about what sort of information that they're giving up. Police department, third floor! Police department, third floor! Put your hands on top of your head. I got it. What do you want in the back? So that's swatting. Um, so that technically was not a no knock raid. Uh, they knocked on the door like three times before they smashed it in and threw something in there. Um, and this is what is happening. You can see lots of other live recordings of it, um, either from the aspect of the SWAT team or from the aspect of the person actually being swatted while they're recording. Um, and uh, it's, it's pretty terrifying um, just to watch it. I can't imagine actually being in that situation. Um, and uh, the, the way that it works when you call 911 is um, with a cell phone number, uh, the, uh, you're, you're sending not only your voice information and your GPS information, but your ANI as well. Um, and uh, with all of that information, including your PANI um, and your phase one and phase two location information, that goes through um, to the PSAP system, which checks the 911 database, um, and it's able to verify if you are um, actually where um, you say you are or if you are actually calling from the number you say you're calling from. So it kind of weeds out people who are trying to spoof other people's numbers. Um, and so what uh, phase one and phase two location data is, it's a callback number, uh, the tower ID that you're actually near. Um, hopefully you're not being routed through a Stingray device. Um, and uh, your estimated caller location, and it also gives a confidence value. Um, so what that does is it confirms and validates uh, the location, um, and it displays the location on the map for the dispatcher, and then it allows them to provide uh, to the vehicles that are nearby routing information for where they should go. Um, so when you want to call in a SWAT, and uh, you'll obviously fail the confirmation um, if you call 911, uh, what do you do to actually get the SWAT team? Uh, and on somebody. You call the non-emergency line. Uh, they don't go through all that fancy stuff. They don't actually check to see if you're spoofing or not or if you are who you say you are. Uh, so when you call the non-emergency line, they still operate as if it's an emergency, uh, but it doesn't have all the fancy tracking. All right, so um, how do we actually defend against this? Uh, well, one of the first lines of defense is social media mindfulness. Um, you don't have to constantly tell everybody where you are at all times um, or uh, everything about your uh, private life online. Uh, so you can uh, tighten a lot of your settings and controls on Facebook, uh, Google+, LinkedIn, um, and uh, restrict your personal information. Uh, if you're South American, high five. Um, and uh, you want to vet your connection requests. Um, LinkedIn is not Pokemon. You don't have to catch them all. Um, you know, it's, it's a really, really useful vector for finding a lot of information about a person or an organization. And um, uh, if you go online right now, you can find research projects of people that are using it to um, out a bunch of people's secrets, uh, especially uh, confidential projects they're working on. Um, untagging yourself uh, pretty judiciously online is uh, something that's very effective. Just because you have good OPSEC does not mean you, that your friends do. Um, so going in and when they tag you, untagging it, because that's what the um, Facebook Graph API uses is tagging. Uh, to find more information about you. Uh, Third-party apps, especially in Facebook, when you install a third-party app, uh, the company that you installed it uh, through does not necessarily own the rights to that app the next year or the year after that. Um, they can sell that information, and they do, 
um, to other companies. And what it does is it not only gives information about uh, your profile, but your friend's profile <coughs> and your friends of friends. And that's very, very good marketing data, or it's data that's useful for somebody who's trying to dox you. Um, you want to, of course, use uh, strong passphrases. Uh, wherever possible, please use two-factor authentication. Um, don't reuse passwords, uh, and especially don't reuse passwords and the same usernames across accounts. I can't tell you how many of our retail, um, of our banking, of our um, hospitality customers constantly have um, automatic account checkers each time there's a new breach. They go and try a bunch of different sites with the same uh, credentials that were uh, dropped in that breach. And a lot of times they get into accounts that way. Um, also, uh, your old accounts, your old dead journal or live journal that has uh, painful things to read in it, um, you don't still need that publicly up and available. Download the information and take it offline. That's information that could definitely be used against you. Um, also, uh, don't assume all info is removable. It's going to be on the internet in some form or another. There's a very good chance for a long time. Um, and when a retail site asks you, hey, do you want me to save your credit card and location information for future purchases? Um, that information goes into a database, um, nine times out of 10, not secured very well. Uh, and that information is going to get breached or leaked at some point in time. And the people who work there have access to it. Um, so for your who is information, when you register a new domain, you don't actually have to put your real information, uh, just an email address that you can be contacted at. Uh, you can also use a third party proxy registration service. Uh, and uh, there, there is some contention about that because the ICANN did recently uh, propose um, that uh, there are some uh, restrictions made on private registration and how it works. Um, I suggest that you keep following that. Um, nothing has been passed yet, but uh, it's definitely something we want to follow. Data clearing houses, uh, they all have opt-out methods. They're legally required to. Uh, they just don't always make them easy to find. Uh, for Spokio people and Zoom Info, um, they just require an email address for verification. Also, it's really small at the bottom, but if you want these slides, um, that uh, hyperlink at the bottom has uh, a list of pretty much all of the major data clearing houses and how to opt out of them. Uh, for white pages opt out, you typically need a, um, uh, an email address and a phone number. Uh, Intellius, I'm not so sure about this one. Uh, I, I want you to take down my personal information, so you're asking me for a copy of my government ID. Uh, so again, uh, your mileage may vary in your own personal risk matrix. If you're a very, very public figure, then that might not be something that's a big deal for you. Uh, if you're a very private individual, you might not want to be giving out more information about yourself. Um, when you're going to register a new company, um, and then I say uh, um, either it's an LLC or a new corporation, or it's something that you want to use to register a patent or a trademark, you don't have to do it with your real name. Um, almost all of the U.S. states allow you to register a fictitious or doing business as name. Um, there are a number of states that don't even require you to register it with them. You can just use it. Uh, for the states that do require you to register it, uh, then you can go to the county clerk's office or the state government website, and there's a place for you to um, create a new fictitious uh, persona for you to uh, do your business through. When you're buying land or property, uh, you don't have to buy it as an individual. Uh, you can buy it through a land trust or a holding corporation. Uh, that holding corporation, you could then uh, use, uh, uh, be, have registered with a fictitious name, so that's another level there. Um, but uh, with a land trust, typically what's shown is only the trust information or the lawyer's information. Um, and land trusts have an added bonus in that they keep the sales price of the property uh, uh, private for most states. Um, and what that does is it makes it so your name, address, <coughs> all of that stuff is not shown on the public county website. Um, I am not a lawyer. I did not stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Uh, so please consult a real estate lawyer before you go through uh, setting up a land trust. Uh, EXIF data. You can wipe EXIF data from your media files um, after you download them to your computer. Uh, my favorite tool for doing this is uh, Phil Harvey's EXIF tool. It works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. And uh, the, the fun thing about this tool is you don't necessarily, it, it can delete all of the metadata, all of the location data, uh, but you can also edit it to put false location and time data into it. So that's fun. <coughs> and I'm sure all the, uh, um, all the, uh, the guys who do uh, forensics research in this room want to strangle me for saying that. But. Um, I also suggest that uh, for your phones, 
um, your iPhones, your iPads, uh, your cameras, you go into those and turn off uh, location tagging or geotagging. A lot of times it's <coughs> by default. Okay. So now we're going to get into the fun area. This is like the tinfoil hat, maskerolfka, I want to be uh, super secret uh, sort of area. So when you use different or meaningless email accounts, usernames, and passwords, uh, not only does it uh, stop people from being able to use account checkers to uh, check and see if you use the same credentials across other websites, but it acts as a, as a sort of canary in the coal mine. Um, and what that is is if you use a very specific email address or unique email address, um, for each account that you sign up for, when you start getting spam or other weird messages to that email address, you know that that company or website has either lost or sold your information. Um, employing pseudonyms, uh, you don't have to use your real name online. Uh, nobody knows you're a dog online. Also, uh, being wary of cloud services. Uh, I don't expect you to raise your hand, but uh, who in here is familiar with the fappening? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll take this laps. Um, so, uh, the fappening, one of the ways that a lot of that information was released was through a, um, uh, a bug that Apple said that they did have and patched um, in iCloud um, that allowed enumeration and then um, access to uh, certain iCloud account information um, that let people download the nudes of celebrities and non-celebrities. Um, so when you have um, information that's just for you or you and your significant other or you and whoever else um, that you want to share uh, your dick pics or whatever with, um, then when you upload it to a cloud service, not only can that be breached and very well might be at some point in time, uh, but whoever works there, unless they're doing encryption on your device, which most of them aren't, um, then they'll also have access to all of that. So that's something to think about. Um, rotating phone numbers and passwords often. Uh, passwords, easy to rotate, especially if you use a uh, password blocker. Uh, but uh, phone numbers, you can use a service like Fring or Google Voice um, to go ahead and rotate those numbers as well. And this also acts as canaries. If you start getting weird calls on a certain phone number, uh, then you know uh, anything that you've used that phone number with uh, has uh, possibly leaked that number. Um, then uh, shredding all of your identifying paper and mail, especially if it's mail that has to do with your health information uh, or mail that has to do with uh, credit information, new credit cards, things like that. Um, uh, if you want to go one step further, check your local burning laws and then burn it. <coughs> uh, doing differentiated information release, uh, saying that uh, you are going on a trip and taking pictures while you're on that trip and uploading them immediately, you don't have to do that. What you can do is hold off for a few months and then upload all of it. That way somebody, like, say, uh, that wants to know where you are, when you are, won't necessarily have that information at that time. Um, you can also post false information, um, you know, pictures of places that you haven't actually been um, or evidence of you doing hobbies that you're not actually into. And what that does is it sort of uh, breaks up that pattern of behavior um, that uh, people will build on you when they're trying to dox you. Uh, it also makes it more likely that the information that you're building in profiles um, conflicts what they're finding in other profiles that you've had. Um, also, cultivating online personas. The longer that you have fake online personas, the more legit they seem. Um, and uh, you know, you want to connect them to different accounts and things like that. Uh, and uh, what that does is once they start to try and match up different profiles uh, to different usernames and email addresses, there's a lot of conflicting information, a lot of noise. Um, this is something that the Soviets were very good at, is uh, putting in lots and lots of false information, but also a little bit of true information, and that's, uh, that's typically what the term Matskudolka points to. So even if you've done all of this, um, or are about to do it, and somebody ends up doxing you, what do you do? Well, you of course uh, mitigate the immediate danger if you think somebody is, um, or if they're saying that they're going to attack you right now, or do something right now, then uh, you know, call 911, contact the police. Um, or uh, you also want to make sure that no matter what, whenever you're docs, file a police report. Um, they might not think much of it at the time, but if you have to go and have an investigation later or contact the FBI later, it'll lend a lot of credibility if you have already have a standing police report. Um, you want to fully document everything that happened, take screenshots, uh, printouts, backups, um, and then if there is no active investigation on the doxing, uh, then you want to go ahead and close down the accounts and clean up the information that they were able to get about you. Um, a few years ago, I would say that they're mostly scams and trash, but now the Credit Watch and ID Theft Watch services, there are some pretty legit ones out there. 
Um, and uh, if you do start seeing or have somebody threatening to use your information for identity theft or you're receiving blackmail attempts, contact the FBI. Those are federal offenses. They do take them seriously. Um, also, uh, this is where Brian Krebs and Ashton Kutcher had a lot of success, is um, they sat down and had conversations with their local police. They had to um, uh, do some education <coughs> and tell them, you know, what doxing is, what swatting is, um, what the fear is and how it works. Uh, and uh, they were able to, now what happens is uh, Brian Krebs gets a call on his cell phone whenever somebody calls on a SWAT attempt. Um, and uh, they say, you know, is, is this legitimate? Are you actually in danger? Um, and he's able to, if he can pick up the phone, say, you know, no, this is bogus, everything's fine. Um, and Ashton Kutcher, what they've been doing is uh, the police in that area will send out uh, two SWAT cars, not the whole SWAT team, to go check it out and then call back in and say whether or not it's a legitimate uh, situation. Um, so uh, I know I don't know all of the doxing um, uh, methods out there, and I don't know all of the ways to defend against them. So um, I'm definitely counting on you all to uh, inform me about those. Um, uh, this is my email address. I would really like you to get in contact with me um, if you want the slides or if uh, you have other information. I'm especially interested in skip tracing. Um, so there are a lot of methods that uh, private investigators and uh, bounty hunters and uh, the bail bondsmen use to uh, get information about people and um, where they are and what they're doing. Um, and I'm in interested in knowing what their techniques and uh, the services that they use are for those. So if you have that information, please hit me up. All right, uh, questions, comments? Yes? I understand Brian said, what, uh, what is Ashton Kutcher that gets it? <laughs> they're jelly. They're jelly. Uh, those kids, uh, they, I mean, they, they see somebody who's, uh, you know, living a life that, uh, that they want and that they don't have. So I think that's a lot of the motivation. Um, also, you know, trying to feel better, you know, taking somebody down a notch, um, uh, putting, uh, you know, whatever's going on in their life out there over there with somebody else, that sort of thing. Yes? This is a more general question. I, I feel like there is a very slow and starting to get growing awareness of doxing and squatting, mm -hmm. or at least you're starting to see discussions Yes. Yeah. Would you say that there are now any kind of efforts to try to arm a fair law enforcement, for example, to be checking the non emergency calls, stuff like that? And so, do you know that? Yes. Uh, so, I have um, actually been giving this talk to a lot of um, law enforcement and government um, groups. And uh, one of the things that I found is uh, that uh, one group in Arizona is working with, uh, especially what they're doing is when they get in a call on the non-emergency line um, uh, that sounds like a swatting attempt, uh, what they'll do is they'll ask for information um, about like, okay, where are you? What neighborhood is that? Um, the sort of information that somebody who is swatting somebody else wouldn't have. Um, and then also um, asking, like going and uh, getting the address and looking to see if that address has already been doxxed, doing a basic Google search. Um, and uh, basically thinking critically about, okay, if, if this person is actually in danger, what sort of information would they have and be able to give me that maybe a potential SWAT or couldn't. Um, and then the other thing is um, not sending out the SWAT team right away. Um, this is a very recent phenomenon. Um, within the past five years, we've seen something like a 4,000% increase in SWAT teams being sent out. Um, and so, uh, you know, they can send a couple of cars over to verify the situation and then call it in. And that's something we see happening in um, some small precincts in Arizona. Yes, yes. Just recently, there was a, a kid who um, uh, was uh, caught and convicted. What kind of tips can you offer for those of us with younger children to uh, kind of help them now when they're still minors to protect themselves so that you know, they don't get like identity mm -hmm. before they're 18 and then So this is something that uh, is, you know, Controversial because it's a topic of parenting, right? Um, and everybody wants to tell you that they know what's best for your kids. Uh, but up to a certain age, you really, I believe, should be monitoring your kids' internet activity. Um, it's, it's the same as you not monitoring them just taking global treks across the world. Um, because that's essentially what they're doing in the digital sphere. Um, and uh, there are ways for people who wouldn't physically have access to them to a digital world to have access to them. 
Um, and so, uh, like, really having conversations, candid conversations about what the dangers are, um, and having them be mindful about what they're doing and why they're doing it, um, and what the con consequences can be. Um, so, children um, uh, up until the age of, I think it's uh, 19 for women and about 21, 22 for men, um, part of their um, brain, uh, the part of the brain that can really understand and grok long term consequences of current actions hasn't fully developed. Um, so to think to yourself that, oh, well, if I just explain it to them, they'll be able to make that decision critically for themselves, uh, they physically can't for most uh, uh, neurotypical uh, human beings. Uh, so you want to go ahead and monitor that yourself. Um, there are lots of software that do that. Do that. Um, you, of course, want to check the security track record for the, any software that you use. Um, then it just gives you a report of like where they went, how long they spent, and things like that. And what I do is, um, for my son, is I let him know. I don't do it surreptitiously. I let him know that this is what I'm doing. Um, and that uh, when he's 18 and he can get his own device and pay for it himself, then, uh, of course, he doesn't have to worry about any of that. Um, but I also let him know uh, why I'm doing it. So, does that answer your question? Uh, sort of. Is it, okay. is it possible, like, have you heard of situations where maybe you set up like, a big identity that you use and then just ditch that when you're 18 or something like that? That's actually a good, good idea. Um, if while you're a kid, uh, you're not actually putting your real information out there. Um, the only problem there is, even if you're using a false identity and they're in a chat room or playing a game online, um, if somebody asks them, hey, what's your name, or hey, where do you live, especially if they started to build up uh, trust or rapport with them, uh, chances are a, a small child's going to just give that information out without thinking about it. Any other questions? Yes. So it really depends on the the current the culture in that current police station, um, and uh, it also depends on what policies they have on the books. Um, there isn't a sort of one size fits all answer. Um, different areas uh, have different levels of militarization um, and different levels of, uh, um, I guess, wanting to send out uh, the full force of their brigade. Um, so it really comes down to having a conversation with your local police about that. Um, a lot of times they'll talk about um, their percentages. If they don't want to talk about it, you can also do a freedom of uh, information request. Um, and uh, it's it really comes down to uh, how... I don't have any tactful way to say this. Um, how uh, how aggressive that they they are, um, or how um, full of power that they're feeling typically. Um, there is there is some national statistics on uh, which are the worst offenders um, that you can find online, uh, but there isn't a way to just say, oh yes, I know this this group is doing this right now and this group is doing that right now. Um, and there are no across the board um, uh, top down uh, regulations or restrictions on how often they can or cannot send them out. So there's no enforcement there. And again, um, communication and education are the biggest weapons here. Um, uh, it's even if you think that uh, your police, your local police, or the police across the uh, uh, U.S. aren't doing the things that you want them to do in the ways you want them to do, um, uh, you know, being uh, contrarian is not going to get any movement forward. Um, it's uh, having conversations and um, educating them. All right. Well, thank you all. <laughs>